Welcome back to What Happens Next, the podcast that examines some of the biggest challenges facing our world and asks the experts, what will happen if we don't change? And what can we do to create a better future? I'm Dr. Susan Carland. Keep listening to find out what happens next. Climate anxiety is important because it can, I think, be galvanized. You have to be worried about something to act on it. Bringing everybody in the, into the discussion of such a big, complex issue is probably what we're going to need to do to really transform things. When we know a lot about statistics, data, number numbers, we know what has happened, we know how it's happening, we know what will happen. Um, We don't know yet how humanity collectively is going to really actively respond to this, to mitigate this crisis and the future of humanity. This week, we're doing something a little bit different on the podcast. Normally, we'd be off on a new topic, but today we're bringing you one final episode on climate anxiety and a uniquely human approach to coping with it. Throughout this series, you've been listening to music from a very interesting project called Climate Notes, created by Drs. Anna McMichael and Louise Devonish from Monash University's School of Music and Performance. Climate Notes is a response to another fascinating undertaking, something called, Is This How You Feel?, Anna and Louise, welcome both of you. Thanks, Susan. Hi. Susan. I want to start by asking you about the Is This How You Feel project. Um, Can one of you start by telling me what is that project? Uh, That's a project that started a while ago um, and it was run by Joe Duggan, who's a science communicator from the ANU. And he collected quite a body of letters by climate scientists and just asked them the really simple question, how does climate change make you feel? And they wrote many handwritten letters, just one A4 page, basically. Um, and my late father was one of those climate scientists that wrote one of the letters. Um, and then he came back a few years later and wanted to ask the same scientists how they feel now, mm. a few years in. And um, as my father passed away, he asked our family to... Um, to write one. And so I was tasked by the family to write one. And as I was writing uh, the letter uh, about how climate change made me feel, I thought because I'm uh, working in the arts and in performing arts, um, it would be great to invite a lot of composers to do the same thing um, and do in effect a musical letter. So um, that's how the, the project came about. And then As it grew, we commissioned, um, I invited Louise Devonish um, to be part of the project as well. And uh, we thought it would be really great to get the public also involved. So it would become a installation performance where people would see the science letters, hear the musical letters, write their own letter, very participatory Mm -hmm. um, installation performance. So Louise, it was called Climate Notes. And so you got composers to write music about how they felt about the climate. Is is that what it was? Yes, that's right. So the Is This How How You Feel collection of letters was handwritten letters. Mm. And Climate Notes builds on that idea to add this collection of musical responses to the question, how does climate change make you feel? And so we approached composers from all around Australia, six different composers, Um, and shared the original collection of letters with them as a point of departure and asked them, can you write a musical response to this question for violin, which is Anna's instrument, Mm. and percussion, which is my instrument. We're all... Were the tones of all the pieces of music similar? Was there, you know, an overarching sense of whimsy or sad? Were there any uplifting pieces? How would you, or were they all extremely diverse? They were all extremely diverse, which was, I guess, what we were hoping as well. Um, I guess 
that arts can ha- has so many different ways of being imaginative and creative. And so some of the composers um, took the letters and literally took, uh, such as one composer, Brie Van Rijk, took the actual words from the letters. So as an inspiration, so we were given um, given the remit to improvise using words such as tipping point or in action or clean and sustainable, these kind of words. Um, other composers uh, used, because we did the project at the um, Botanic Gardens in Melbourne, so they used uh, one composer, Daniel Blinkhorn, used the biomes, the different biomes of the Botanic Gardens to try and, with field recordings, um, capture the sounds of the different biomes. Another composer took the botanical specimens, the collection state botanical specimens at the uh, Melbourne Gardens. And um, so you see the beautiful specimens, see a video, see the sort of care that's gone into cataloguing them, but also the dried specimens, um, putting music to those, so giving colour back to them. So that's the musical function. And um, Kathy Milliken sent us out to the Desert Garden in Cranbourne. So Louise and I tracked out there and went into the middle of the Desert Garden and recorded a video and captured all the sounds around the gardens, the planes going overhead and the, the crows and um, had a, a video actually in the middle of the Desert Garden. So all the composers really wanted us to do very different things. Mm. And then were they recorded as, uh, was it a recording that then people could listen to? Was it a live performance? How did people hear it? We like to think of this project as being a kind of suite of different ways to engage with this question of what climate change feels like. Uh, So there are, as Anna mentioned, a series of video works which show um, photographs of some of the original handwritten letters, video footage that we captured on the two Royal Botanic Garden sites and performance footage mixed in with studio recorded versions of these musical pieces. So that kind of exists as an installation which can be viewed in a kind of art exhibition format. And then there are also the concert pieces, if you like, that can be experienced in a live concert setting. Mm -hmm. So people can choose to engage with these works and that question in that way. And then, as Anna mentioned earlier, there is a a wall of letters that we put up as part of the exhibition, which includes some of the original copies of the original handwritten letters and a letter writing station where the general public can write their own letter and stick that on the wall and add to this growing discourse about what it feels like to live in the world at this point in the climate crisis when we know a lot about statistics, data, number, numbers. We know what has happened. We know how it's happening. We know what will happen. Um, we don't know yet how humanity collectively is going to really actively respond to this to mitigate this crisis and the future of humanity. So having the project exist in these three ways offers people different points of access to this really challenging topic. I mean, the climate crisis is something that is so immense. It's very difficult for individuals to grasp the scale of it and also grasp our part in that and what we can do as individuals, as small communities, as countries, as humanity um, to respond to this crisis. So because humans respond to things in different ways, the project offers different ways to connect with this And Louise, what kind of things would people write in their letters? Well, they were as diverse as the musical works themselves. And that makes sense in many ways because, you know, the experience of what it feels like to live at this point in the climate crisis is very individual and very personal. So some people drew pictures. (laughs) Some people wrote poems. Hmm. Uh, There are a couple of just happy and sad faces up there as well. And other people wrote quite long letters that were quite detailed. And we had left the letter writing invitation quite open. So people could choose to address it to Joe Duggan, to address it to us, to not address it to anyone. They could choose to sign it or not. And so that meant that people responded in quite, quite different ways. Some spoke specifically about how they were worried about their future um, personally and the future of their families. 
Um, others spoke more of hope um, and ideas and positive messages. So it, we really saw the full spectrum of emotions represented across the letters. And I think the musical works represent a full spectrum of responses as well. Now, Anna, I'm not going to ask you if you had a favourite piece of music because that would be cruel, but was there a piece of music that resonated with you more than others and why? Why that one? Um, I think there's one piece which for me was really cha challenging, maybe not so much for Louise, but um, it was by a composer, Brie Van Rijk, and it involved uh, building our own instrument and learning how to play that as well. Oh, <laughs> so you got homework. Yes, which for me was was great as a violinist who sort of uh, learned to play a very, you know, refined, sophisticated um, instrument, uh, hundreds of years old, uh, having to sort of get back to basics and I guess. Wait, 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 wait what was this instrument you had to build? Um, so there, there's a, it's quite a complex story around the the instrument I, I guess she was wanting to get right back to basics to have to rethink things to have to um which is something to do with the climate crisis as well to have to simplify lives or think in a different way think a bit outside the box um but she also had the idea that this might be at a time where uh possibly there were less trees around or trees didn't mm. so she built, or the idea was that we build our own tree out of strings and um, wood and porcelain, bits of old rusty saws from the back of the shed kind of thing, and um, string this up, learn to play it, and then respond to the letters um, with the uh, improvisational um, uh, phrases from the letters. So for me as a violinist, that was really great. Louise is a bit more accustomed to this kind of thing with as a percussion instrument but um uh it also has a lot of strong quite strong visuals mm. of uh um Antarctica and uh the barrier reef and uh so it's quite a visual piece as well and um, they did have a name these instruments and they're called replica trees mm. so her work consisted of designing these sculptures these sculptural musical instruments and composing the work as well and what Brie was trying to do was find something instrumental where the violin and the percussion instruments met in the middle so these replica trees not only were they this kind of playful reflection on what someone might build if they went out to their shed and using the materials, the urban materials at hand, what they might build as a tree, but something that had a little bit of string playing and string technique because it did have three or four strings right down the, the middle of the trunk, if you like, mm. and something that brought in percussion technique, so um, instruments that could be struck or, or rubbed or bowed. Um, and so it, we had one each of these replica trees. And so they had um, quite a strong visual presence on the stage. And it was quite interesting, I think, to be playing these trees that were actually made of saws, different types of saws and saw blades, which are used to cut down trees, which is part of this whole climate discussion that, that we're part of. That was a lot of fun, um, receiving this huge box from Brie with all of the dissembled and pre-cut porcelain tiles and saw blades and piano wires and bits of wood, um, putting them together on site. And she was really thoughtful and put a box of Band-Aids in there, just because we didn't know what we were doing, but, but we did okay. So that piece was quite fun for the experience of making the instrument as well as sounding the instrument. Those trees sound like something from Mad Max. Like if there were trees that were instruments, sort of this dystopian future. And it was interesting as you mentioned the bit about playing saw blades and there being Band-Aids in the box it kind of feels like the environment's fighting back. It, it's fighting back against what you're doing to it. The, the environment's responding, which I suppose, you know, is, is part of the conversation as well. Do either of you have climate anxiety? Um, I would say I have, I have a faint tinge of climate anxiety. I, I guess I've grown up with that most of my life uh, with my father's work and my sister works at the um, uh, at Melbourne University, that geography, uh, earth sciences. So she's also in uh, mm -hmm. working in in climate um, crisis and migration patterns. So it's sort of been something in our family that I've been brought up on, I guess. Yeah. And what about you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I don't think we're alone in in feeling. Mm. I mean, there are words for these feelings: eco grief, eco anxiety, are terms that are 
in the vernacular now. And I think the existence of those words maybe points to the fact that it's a, a phenomenon that's experienced by many. Um, so yeah, it is something I think about a lot and I do feel quite acutely. Um, so it's really wonderful to be able to harness the tools that we have in our musical practice to be able to contribute to the discussions about about this, about the anxiety itself, but the larger issue as well. But music isn't the only way we express our feelings. As you browse the shelves of your local bookstore, you may notice a certain theme cropping up more and more. Hi, I'm Adeline Johns Butcher. I'm a professor of literature and the head of arts and social sciences at Monash University, Malaysia. I'm a literary scholar with research interests mainly in the relationship between literature and climate change. Adeline, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Tell us what climate fiction is. Well, climate fiction, as far as I define it, is simply fiction that deals with anthropogenic climate change, that is human-made global warming as we've understood it in the past, um, the, since the middle of last century. And it deals with climate change in any way, whether it's in its setting or its plot or something its characters deal with. Um, so that's it. It is fiction about climate change. That's mm. the way I define it. And so does it have overlaps with other genres or is it very much a, a standalone genre? No, it's not. Uh, um, and in fact, you know, uh, literary scholars might quibble about the extent to which it's a genre. And I've got into that conversation myself. Um you know, it's not a genre in that it doesn't have really strict generic rules. You know, uh, so detective fiction would be, okay, you know, it's going to be a whodunit and you're not going to know until the end. You know, romances need to end happily in marriage, that kind of thing, right? Um, no, that doesn't necessarily happen with climate fiction. It just happens to do with climate change. So in one sense, anything could be a climate novel, right? You could have a uh, comedy and some have attempted to write satires on the way people deal with climate change. Um, not very many people do climate romance. Uh, and, you know, you could have realist novels, which are great, many of them, and, of course, science fiction, because imagining a world in the future or, um, you know, somewhere else extraterrestrially uh, affected by climate change in the way ours is, is a major form of climate fiction. You mentioned that not many people successfully have managed to write sort of climate fiction that incorporates romance or is a romantic climate fiction. Why do you think that is? Is it because ultimately climate fiction or cli-fi makes us anxious? Yes, I think that's a big part of it. You know, I think romance um, comes into some of these stories, um, but um, I think there are a couple of reasons. Yes, it, it's the... Um, the enormity of the issue. So, okay, I've said it doesn't have generic rules, but the pressures of representing climate change and, and, and engaging people in the issue will have created over time uh, a certain, um, you know, some characteristics, okay? So uh, I tend to put climate fiction into two broad categories, the ones that project you into, you into a world that is changed by climate um, change. And, uh, and of course, romance can happen there, right? And all the realist novels that are set in the here and now in which people do grapple with the ethical dilemma of what we are grappling with, the anxieties of climate change. And of course, anxiety happens in both those uh, types mm. of novels. But does romance happen? Yes, it can. But, you know, the enormity of it is, yes, you're dealing with something that creates great um, emotional angst for us, but you're also dealing with something that makes human dreams and hopes and ambitions look really very trivial. Mm. Individual hopes and ambitions. Okay, and that is one of the great challenges of representing climate change. Uh, actually saying, look guys, this matters. And this matters for, you know, this probably the thing that climate change is and the reason it dwarfs individual 
hopes and dreams is because it affects the entire planet, every single human being on it, and more than that, every single non-human being. And it's affecting all of us, human and non-human, into the future. Do you think that reading Cli-Fi can help us deal with or alleviate some of the anxiety or at least process some of the anxiety that we might have about climate change? Yes. Yes. I think it offers an important space. But as I say that, I think I want to add a few provisos. I think that um, novels that deal with issues of great political um, and social and even economic import, like climate change, um, but like the protest, the line of protest fiction that you could put climate change in, uh, issues, you know, the novels that have dealt with um, the plight of enslaved people in the United States, novels that have dealt with women's rights, novels that have dealt with civil rights, civil rights, okay? Um, shedding light on all of that and allowing people a voice and allowing people to see that their suffering is shared is important, okay? So it, just creating space is really important. And climate anxiety is, is um, something that is shared by, as it turns out, the people who can do something about climate change. And that's the other proviso I want to make. But climate anxiety is important because it can, I think, be galvanized. You have to be worried about something to act on it. And I think that's where climate change is climate fiction is really useful. So it becomes a space to deal with that anxiety and process it because all good fiction becomes a space for thinking through your feelings and thinking through your ideas. I think where climate anxiety becomes useful is if we make a distinction between what environmentalists call uh, full stomach and empty belly environmentalism. Okay. Those of us with full stomachs can afford to experience climate anxiety. And those of us with empty bellies really have other things to worry about. Okay. And we, and that's a really, very, really important distinction in climate when it comes to climate change. Because those of us with the full stomachs experience that anxiety, think through these ideas, and we need to then not be paralyzed by it and do something with it. So that those of us with the empty bellies have people thinking and worrying and then acting on their behalf. And the best climate novels allow that, that to happen. Does climate fiction inspire change in readers? Does it make them want to take action or actually do things? I don't think any single climate text could. And, you know, I don't think climate fiction writers, I don't think authors want that responsibility. Mm. I think authors want to write inspiring stories. They want to inspire, not... Um, necessarily teach us um, um, but inspire us to do good things possibly um, I think a good writer gets the book out into the world and wants people to do their own thing with it so no single text can do that and not even a really important climate fiction text and I'm going to look at film now rather than novels and you know day, the day after tomorrow really um, famous climate fiction film it came out uh, in 2004 and studies were done um, that showed that actually when people watched it, once you kind of um, allowed for changes, you know, differences in demographics um, and, you know, and even allowed for the, understood the politics of the people who actually went to see the film versus people who didn't see the film and, you know, it, and you weren't self-selecting. After all that, you know, they were, you know, 70% would say they were more interested in doing something about climate change and even voting differently. Versus 50% who hadn't seen the film. It was those types of figures. So yeah, one text can do something. But the overall findings, and this is a really uh, large-scale project, were that even such a film didn't have a huge effect. It didn't reach enough people. We might think of it as a blockbuster, but actually it wasn't a blockbuster on the scale of you know, the Star Wars franchise. But I think there's a cumulative effect. I think... And I mentioned protest fiction earlier. I think that you can let air into a topic and uh, um, create, inject more awareness into what I think of as the discursive universe that readers and writers inhabit. And you, you know, you can't, uh, you know, 
you can't go, you can't n not notice that climate um, change is is in the texts we read and some of the films we watch and so on, more and more. A single work probably can't change the world. And that's likely a relief for writers, artists and musicians everywhere. What art can do, however, is give everyone a voice. Anna and Louise noticed this in the Climate Notes letters. I noticed that a lot of the letters were, as Louise said, were quite poetic or sort of artistic in their own way. So it um, is a is a moment when people can really contemplate things and also think a bit more open sky about things, mm. which is what the arts can really bring, yeah. I think, to the conversation. So, yeah, allowing people to feel as if their individual voice, they have agency and they really have a, can contribute something is what we wanted to do as well. Louise, do you think it helped people? Well, music is, music and sound are an abstract art form, um, which means that music has this extraordinary power to contain and convey and communicate things in different ways than words or numbers might be able to, mm. um, which is what makes music such a wonderful tool for storytelling. And storytelling is such a big part of what makes us human. And telling stories around huge issues like this is how we can um, start to tackle them and engage with them, I think. Um, but because music is an abstract art form, it means that as makers, we make something and we know what we're trying to communicate. We know our feelings. Um, we know what the work means to us. But there is a relinquishing that happens in the performance experience or the exhibition experience where we put this thing out in the world and how others choose to respond to it or engage with it is really up to them. And there are thousands of right ways to engage with abstract art like this. So I hope that those people who came to these performances in the exhibition um, were moved maybe to reflect on on this issue in a different way than they they might be if they're reading a newspaper or a blog about these things. So that's the hope. Mm. The letters suggest that people did feel something and engage in that way, but not everyone chose to write a letter. Others yeah. reflect on these things in different ways. So. Yeah. And I guess that is one of the many gifts of, of the arts is that you see throughout human history, even the earliest records we have of humans, we've used art to help process our understanding of what's happening in the world around us. And I guess this is just a, another modern example of that. Although, you know, from what you said, it, it came at a bit of a cost to you guys cutting your hands while you're putting it together. But I suppose that's all good art too. It, it, it costs you something. Um, do you think, my last question is, do you think your work can be seen as a, a is it a type of therapy for people, for yourselves, for the audience, for the composers? Um, I guess I was I was interested to see how many people wanted to read other people's letters as well. As well that um, we hadn't. Uh, I guess that was always obvious that that might happen, but it, 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 I've noticed that people really do engage with with all the public letters as well. Um, Is this, do you think, us not wanting to feel alone in our feelings? Well, I think so. I think so. And also, um, yeah, people are uh, feeling as if uh, they'll read someone else's letters and they have those feelings as well. And it's not a scientist and it's not a not sort of an, um, an expert on the area talking about it. It's just another person and their thoughts. And actually the science letters come across in a similar way. They're not... Um, about the data, they're really, really deep feelings. So um, I think it allows people to think, to to feel they're not alone. With yeah, them. it's almost like reading someone else's diary. Yeah, you get that little window into someone's you know most intimate emotions that we very rarely actually get. So I imagine it, it must have felt quite a privilege to read those letters, did it? Yeah, I think so. And there's something about the fact they're handwritten as well. Um, with some of them, you can make a guess, oh, is this a young person writing or an older person writing? And how does their handwriting reflect them in a different way than the words themselves? But yeah, I think reading other people's letters, especially the feelings that are uncomfortable around this issue, like feelings, not just of anxiety, but maybe a little bit of guilt that we have mm. around whatever, uh, you know, recycling or anything like that. There's some, as a feeling of validation that comes with reading another person's honest letter where they say, I'm worried about this and this is how I feel about it. And it allows a reader to feel those same things, which I think is quite nice. Louise and Anna, thank you both so much for your time today. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Susan. This is our final episode on climate anxiety. Thank you to all our guests on this series, Professor Adeline Johns-Putra, Dr Anna McMichael, 
Dr. Louise Devonish, Amanda McKenzie, Callie O'Shaughnessy, Dr. Rhonda Garrard, Associate Professor Susie Ho, Professor Alan Reed, and Dr. Rebecca Huntley. You can learn more about all their work by visiting our show notes. Join us next week on What Happens Next when we'll explore an all new topic.